All right, I believe we're on. Uh, again, I'm honored to be able to be here, and uh, especially to be able to, you know, to do something to help Glenn while, while he's away. Um, the, the genesis of this message began um, actually just before Christmas. Um, as I, you know, in my quiet time, as I was reading scripture and thinking, I began thinking about the incarnation of Jesus. It's a big topic. Uh, and uh, just thinking about how God fleshed out his life in the person of Jesus. And, and as I thought about that, I, I became even more and more impressed by how absolutely different Christianity is from all the other religions in the world. I mean, what other God comes to earth to love his people and to redeem them from sin? I mean, is there any other God and all the, the gods of all the nations? No. You know, what other God makes it a point to move from heaven to live in this corrupted and filthy place? Nobody. I mean, it's Jesus. I don't know whether how many of you in school uh, studied anthropology, but when I was in college, and this was many years ago, um, when I was in college, I took a course in the anthropology of religion. It was something I thought, this would be interesting to do. And so uh, in, in this course, we, we studied the, the religious systems. Actually, that semester, it was three tribes in East Africa. And the New Air, the Kikuyu, and one other tribe I can't remember. And the thing I got from that uh, is that in, in all the religions of the world, there are these marked similarities between them all. They have different names. The gods have different names. Um, they, there are differences in many ways, but in a lot of ways, their their equivalence between the, all the various religions is amazing. And uh, there's always a major god, and then there's his wife and their kids, and there's a pantheon of a bunch of other gods that, that figure in. And if you match the pantheons of these various tribal deities as well as the gods of Europe and Asia, and you put it all together, it, it's amazing how similar there are. They all have different names. Um, but, you know, those of us, you, you remember in Greek mythology, there was Zeus, and then in Roman, there was Jupiter, basically the same, same god. Uh, if you are, you know, watching the, the Marvel comic universe, you know, you know, Thor is, you know, he's from Odin, and Odin was the Zeus and the Jupiter of Northern Europe, and so, uh, and we're going to be going to Norway, and we'll be you know, learning all about that, you know. So, there, there are a lot of these similarities, and then in the Bible, when you read the Bible and you see the various religions there, you know that a lot of the peoples of the surrounding Israel. The, the Canaanites worshipped Baal, whose name was also Beelzebub. And those of you who were in high school, you remember reading that book, The Lord of the Flies? Remember that? That's Beelzebub. That's his name, the Lord of the Flies. That was, that was the meaning of the word. And I think that was George Orwell. But he, it's all, it's amazing how it all figures together. But there's Baal, there's Asherah, there's Ashtaroth, there's Marduk, there's Molech. And some of these gods were really vicious. And when we're reading through the Bible, and so you've already, I'm sure, read where people would, would burn their children on the fire as offering them to, God, to their God. And the God of the Bible says, it never, I never thought that anyone would do this. I never asked anyone to sacrifice their child. What are you thinking? But this was a common practice. There was one king who even offered his firstborn son this way. Oh, man. But all the gods were pretty much alike, and, and they have human foibles, idiosyncrasies. You know, they, they do things, they're fickle, they're petty, they're jealous. It's like watching a soap opera, reading the stories of these gods. The one thing, none of them have power to effect a positive change in the world. None of them have power to effect a positive change in anything. They just go about doing what they do. Everything's run by faith. Man, how different is the God of the Bible? How different is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Our God stands alone in the midst of all the religions of the world. The God of the Bible claims exclusivity. Amen. Our God says that he and he alone is God. Our God declares that all the gods of this world are false gods. In Isaiah 43, 11, God says, I, 
even I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. In Isaiah 44, verse 8, he says, There is no other rock, I know not one. Now you might say, well, you know, this is like a schoolyard argument about my God is bigger than your God. No. Our God is worlds apart from other gods. Other gods require sacrifice. Sometimes, as I said, even human sacrifice. And what is a vain attempt to secure the support of the gods? Other gods require their worshipers to measure up to their demands. In other faiths, you don't find a concept of grace. You don't find a concept of self-giving love. You don't find forgiveness. None of that. Instead of forgiveness, there's revenge. Instead of the redemptive purposes of God, there's fatalism. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. And so... Even more surprised are we when we learn that it is the desire of our God to dwell among us. This is like really surprising because unlike us, our God is holy. Our God is set apart from the fickle and the finite. He's set apart from all the petty jealousies of people. In Exodus 25, 8, and this is the the passage that I've chosen for the text today, but there's a bunch of texts we're going to run across, and and this is just one. But in Exodus 25, verse 8, God says, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Why would God want to do that? Why would God want to have a desire to live among us? I mean, an even more basic question, why would God want to know us at all? Why would he love us? I mean, given what a mess we've made of his creation, given our penchant for cruelty and selfishness, why would God bother? Tell you, if I were God, you'd all be toast. I'd be toast. I mean, to experience the wickedness of, you got to just watch the news, you know. To experience the wickedness of people just a couple of times ought to be enough for God to learn, you'd think he was smart, he would learn, that we are not worthy of being loved. We're not worthy of being known. We're not worthy of being visited by a righteous and holy God from heaven. And if you think otherwise, I you know, In in, uh, 2000, I had abdominal surgery, and I went to Boston to meet the surgeon, and we get into this conversation about God. She believed, like William Emerson Fostick, that every day and in every way we are getting better and better. You know, she had a very positive view of people. And so I say to her, I said to her what I'll say to you. Are you soft? Consider Dachau the ovens. Consider the gas chambers of Auschwitz, the gulags of Russia, the killing fields of Cambodia, the trail of tears from Georgia to Oklahoma, wounded knee in South Dakota. Think of the ethnic genocides in Armenia and Rwanda. Think of slavery in the American South, or anywhere in America in the early part. I mean, and that's just a very small list of man's inhumanity toward his brothers and sisters. What would possess the God of heaven to leave the holiness and glory of his throne and come to this planet? All of humanity speaks with one united voice. We are a faulty and filthy species that is fully capable of unspeakable behaviors. And so, as I said, I've been captivated by the thought of God's incarnation in human flesh, in the person of Jesus. I'm amazed by the majesty of God. I'm amazed by his willingness to shed the trappings of glory and to leave the presence of the Almighty Father in order to move in with us. And then I'm amazed that Jesus would want to be around people like us, that he would desire to join with us, that he would want to share with us in the misery that is life on this planet. Today we come to worship. We worship God because we have figured out 
that God is at work in us. And for his own reasons, he has drawn us to himself with cords of loving kindness. Now certainly he didn't have to love us, but he wanted to love us. That's the part I find amazing. God was not compelled by some law. He was compelled by his love. We've come to worship because after we discovered that God was at work in us, we then began to discover that we wanted God to work in us. We want God to love us. We want to know his love. We're actually hungry for the love of God. Our heart's desire is to know him, and we want him to reveal himself to us. What a wonderful realization that is. And so in the spirit of Philippians 4.8, where Paul asks his listeners to fix their minds on whatever is pure and whatever is pure and true and lovely, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, let's spend our time together this morning thinking about God's revelation of himself in Jesus, the incarnate Son of God and Son of Man we first begin to realize that something's up when we read the first chapter of John, the prologue, those first few verses. It's lofty language. might take you a few times to get your head wrapped around it. might take you a better part of your life to get your head wrapped around it. But in those first few verses, the Apostle John is describing the second person of the Trinity as being God himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is God without beginning. He is God who created. And now he is God who sustains the whole universe by the power of his word. God speaks and stuff happens. And then in verse 14, John says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, given our sinful nature, given our propensity for cruelty, given the perverse joy we gain from rebelling and living life the way we want to live it, isn't it shocking to learn that you and I are loved by God? We're not just liked the way you would like somebody on Facebook. We're loved desperately loved, radically loved, even violently loved. And I say violently loved because wicked men manhandled Jesus, tortured Jesus, while he persisted to love us. Had that been me, I'd have signed off on that early. I don't like pain. But he submitted to their torture, and he loved us. He endured the cross, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. You know what that joy is? It's you and me. You and me. He was glad to do it for us. And if that isn't enough to make you stop and bow before him, God loves us with such power that Jesus was willing to divest himself of all the trappings of glory and be born as a defenseless and vulnerable baby. I mean, I could almost see it if he had come as a full-grown man, strong, you know, a manly man, astride some horse or, you know, a Sherman tank or something, and came in and, like, did business. But he didn't. He came as a baby. And when you see a newborn and you, you reflect on that child's complete and total inability to care for itself, again, what kind of logic did God employ to open the door to, of heaven and walk into our lives arriving as an infant? The Bible says that God took on our human flesh and he took on our weakness. He didn't walk in weakness until it became inconvenient. He walked totally in obedience to the will of his father his whole life, even to the point of being executed in the most heinous and humiliating way man could imagine. 
I'm stunned. And I'm humbled by the love of Jesus for you and me. Hebrews 12, 2 says, the great joy filling the heart of Jesus, and that joy is you and me, redeemed and restored to the fullness of God's intention for mankind. In Jesus, we are restored to be the beloved sons and daughters of God Most High. Jesus actually scorned the shame of the monstrous indignity that was being visited upon him because he was then and is even now today, even right now at 11, 18 a.m., he is working on our lives. He is perfecting our faith. He's bringing us to maturity. He's working his love in us. He's making us complete. He's making us whole. He's bringing to, the, to completion the good work he began in us. That's what he's doing. The testimony of Scripture is constant throughout the Bible concerning this part of God's purpose in his word. You know, I said Exodus 25, 8, I will dwell among them. In Leviticus 26, verse 11, God says, I will put my dwelling place among you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. Knowing now what he knew about us even then, even at the dawn of history, God was determined to create a place for us in his presence. It isn't just him coming to us. He's preparing a place for us to be with him. In Ezekiel 37, God says again, My dwelling place will be among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. There's no mistaking his intention. God will dwell among us, and we will dwell with him. In the middle of such amazing, wonderful promises, Zechariah 2, God says, Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming, and I will live among you. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. How about that? For I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. And what we learn here is, it isn't just for Israel. It's not just for America. It's not just for Europe. It's not just for South America. It's not just for Africa. It's not just for Asia. It's for the whole of this world. For every person. For a myriad of nations all of whom are just as lost as we are, God will not be happy until there's a multitude that no one could count from every tribe, people, and language standing before the throne of God and in front of the Lamb. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 7. The revelation of God in Scripture culminates in that grand and final scene in Revelation 21 where we come to the end of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, and now the rest of the story. You know, here's a picture of a new heaven and a new earth, fully redeemed, fully restored. And John hears a voice from the throne of, of heaven declaring the fulfillment of God's will. It's all over now. It's done. It's complete. The end result of all the purposes of God finally resolved, finally brought to completion. And here is what it says. Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Yeah. God's not talking about the future. He is speaking in the present tense in that passage. He is saying the work is completed, the work is finished. God is talking about accomplished facts, a completed work. God really is with us. He truly is Emmanuel. Every day you and I live in this veil of tears we call life. Parents die. Wives and husbands succumb to cancer. Children run amok and go astray. Our homes face foreclosure. Our professional lives bottom out and collapse. There's sickness and addiction. There's loss abounding all around us. 
But the word of God declares hope for us. God says, I will dwell among them. That's a good word. It's an important word when stuff is falling apart. We are not now, nor will we ever be alone. We are not now, nor will we ever be forsaken. We are not now, nor will we ever be rejected. We are not now, nor will we ever be abandoned. The Bible teaches that while we were far away from God, while we wallowed in our rebellion, He drew near to us. He came close. He reached out and touched us. He drew us to Himself with cords of loving kindness, and He died for the ungodly. I mean, how do you respond to a truth of that magnitude? When God says he's willing to come and live with us, the question is not, will he do what he says? No, he's been there, done that. God has done what he said he would do. The real question is, will I welcome him? Or will I do to God what I've been afraid of my whole life that God would do to me? Namely, will I leave him? Will I abandon him? Will I forsake him? Because God is not about to do that to you. He's promised never to leave us or forsake us. But will I choose to leave him when he has come such a great distance to draw near to me? So consider, will you allow God to take up residence you know, right here, to come into your life, to live in your heart? Will you allow God to, to so work in you that people all around you, whether it's at home or at school or at work or wherever you are, that people will be able to see that you know, what I'm looking at isn't the weak and broken person. It's the living God who's living his life, his victorious life through you. To be incarnate is to become human flesh, meaning that God literally moved into the neighborhood he knows exactly what human life is like. There's no surprising him here. He's not put off by our behaviors. He's not repulsed by the decaying smell of our failures. You and I are greatly loved. We're fully and wondrously cared for by this God of ours, this holy God who is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the Lord of Lords, of which there are no others. You may be struggling to know whether you can receive that love of His or whether you can be changed into a person of faith and hope. And I want to encourage you today, seriously, to sit back and relax. Stop struggling. Stop striving. Stop fighting. And, and simply just open your hands to him. Open your heart to him. Simply receive. Say, yes, Jesus, I receive you. God promised that he would come and live with us. He would come and dwell with us. He would come and take up residence right here where we live. If you're hungry for that to happen... The good news is, is that God is more eager than you are for it to happen. And so I just want to encourage you to let him embrace you with his love. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your persistence on the cross. We thank you that while we were far, far, far away from you, while we were rebelling and enjoying it, while we were running away, you reached out and drew us in. Thank you, Father, that even when we have done wrong, nasty wrong, horrible wrong, that it's not a wrong for which there's no forgiveness because of your great love. There is no love like the love of our God. 
and the love that we have for each other, the love that we have for our husbands and our 